There's a passage where a monk has tried to explain the Buddha's position on the status of an arahant after death. We all know that the Buddha refused to say whether the arahant existed or didn't exist, or both or neither. And this monk had said, well, there's another alternative. He didn't say what the alternative was. He mentioned this to some sectarians, and they said, well, that's not what we've heard from other Buddhist monks. You better, you better go check that with the Buddha. And so he does. And the Buddha gives a long explanation as to why he took no position at all. Nobody you could say the fully awakened person existed, didn't exist, both, neither, after death. And there was no other possibility of explaining. He didn't describe it at all, that person at all. He finally explained why, until the monk understood. And then the Buddha concluded by saying, it's only stress that I teach and the ending of stress. Or dukkha. It's only suffering that I teach and the ending of suffering. Now some people have taken that to say, well, in that case, all the teachings we have about devas and nagas and other levels of being, those are probably not part of the Buddhist teaching because they have nothing to do with stress and the ending of stress. And then there are other people who say, well, maybe the Buddha meant something else. Maybe he didn't say only. But it's there in the text, only stress and the ending of stress. The point, however, is that the Buddhist teachings on the cosmos are not totally irrelevant to the ending of stress. Because after all, he wants to describe what stress is, and part of stress is birth. What kind of births are there? Well, there are lots of different kinds of birth. And wherever there's birth, there's going to be aging, illness, death. Except for some of the deva realms where there's no illness, no aging. But even still, wherever there's birth, there's death. And it's good to know that. Because there were Brahmas who felt that they were going to live eternally because they had been born into a world that didn't seem to change at all. But the fact that they were born there meant that they were going to leave. So all this comes under the truth of stress, all the levels of the cosmos. And it's good to keep that in mind. Though a lot of us are not going to experience those levels in our meditation, but some people will. And it's easy to get waylaid, easy to get misled by what you see there. You think you've attained the goal when it's simply a level of concentration or it's a, one of the sensual levels of pleasure. So it all comes under stress, and it all performs a function. And it's good to notice that also when the Buddha talks about cosmology, he doesn't talk about it in a lot of detail. It's a sketch. It's just a sketch, just enough to gain a sense of this is one of the possible rebirths, and one of the things that we're trying to grow out of, trying to go beyond. And there are a lot of other issues like that in terms of cosmology. that the Buddha taught, because they were relevant to the issue of putting an end to stress. And he taught them only from that angle. Didn't go into them beyond that. So when we look at his teachings, remember they're all relevant. He once stated that the only things he would say would be true and beneficial and timely. Then when he laid out the different permutations of those three tests, the idea that something could be beneficial but untrue just was not even considered as a possibility. There's no room for useful fictions in his teachings. Though for us, we don't know. As long as we practice and haven't encountered any of these things, we can just file them away for future reference. To focus on what we're doing right now. But follow them away with a sense of appreciation that there was someone who actually went to all the trouble to find all this and then to teach it. There's that other story in the canon where the Buddha, after his awakening, was thinking about teaching and he just saw about how difficult it was going to be. 
Because think about it, he was going to set out a Dhamma and a Vinaya. And the Vinaya especially was going to be difficult, because he's going to be fighting with people's defilements. Of course, setting out the Dhamma, he was fighting with people's defilements too. People took umbrage at what he had to say. They got upset by what he had to say. And they would come and they would argue. Now, in some cases he saw that they were sincere in their arguments, and he would engage in debate with those people. But there are others who were just out there to cause trouble. There was one guy who would go around and one day he said to him, I'd like to go up and stir up some trouble. I'll find some contemplative and whatever he has to say, I'll argue with it. There's a lot of that in the world. So a guy came to see the Buddha, the Buddha put him in his place. I think about it, here's the Buddha who went through all that trouble to gain awakening. And he could have not taught at all. After all, once you gain full awakening like that, you have no debts to anybody. We sometimes think about the kindness of our parents, the kindness of our teachers. And part of the mind is say, well, they had to be kind to us. If they, if our parents had aborted us or thrown us away, they would have broken the law. So in some cases they felt compelled to, to look after us. But with the Buddha there was no compulsion at all. There was no debt at all that he had to repay. That's what the whole point of that story is. He thought of not teaching after thinking about all the difficulties. And one of the Brahmas was upset. Said, My gosh, here he's gone to all this trouble to gain awakening, and now he's not going to teach. So he came down and invited him. He said, there are those with little dust in their eyes. They will understand the Dhamma. So the Buddha contemplated that and said, yes, there would be. And so out of his totally pure compassion, he gave us the teaching. He spent 45 years setting up the Dharma, setting up the Vinaya, setting up the monastic Sangha, teaching people to become members of the Noble Sangha so the Dharma would last long enough. Here it is, 2,600 years later, and it's still with us. So when we take on his teachings as working hypotheses, we should also take them on with a sense of appreciation. All the trouble he went through to bring us these teachings, to find these things out. So the proper response is gratitude. In fact, this is a proper response to a lot of things in the world, but especially for the Dharma. There's such a large sense of entitlement in our world right now. People feel they're owed this, they're owed that. And whatever comes their way that's good, they just take it for granted, without realizing all the difficulties that people have gone through in order to create a society that works somewhat. may not be perfect. But think of what society would be like if everyone just decided, okay, I've had enough of this. We wouldn't be able to live. So it's good to reflect every day. We're dependent on the goodness of a lot of people. And the fact that there was someone who went to all the trouble of just of going beyond just making sure that we could live together but we could live in such a way that we could find meaning in life. Because after all, we engage in so much needless suffering, and we cause so much needless suffering. And we fight one another, one another over that, creating more suffering. So here's the Buddha coming to see how to find a way out. He's found the way out. He gives us the way out. And a lot of people don't appreciate that. Remember the case of Ajahn Mahabhu in Thailand. He went to so much trouble to defend the forest tradition, to defend the Dharma. And there was actually someone who tried to kill him one time. You can imagine what he felt. 
He didn't owe anything to anybody. It was out of the pure goodness of his heart that he taught. And there are people who took offense. Of course, there are people who tried to kill the Buddha, too. He had nothing but compassion for them. The, the hired, you can't call them hired guns, they didn't have guns in those days, but the hired bow and arrows. One guy was hired to kill the Buddha, and then two people were hired to kill the first one, and then four were hired to kill the, the, the two, and eight were hired to kill the four, and sixteen were hired to kill the eight. The first one came to see the Buddha, and he just couldn't do it. And the Buddha taught him, and actually taught him to become a stream enterer. And the same with the two, and the four, and the eight, and the sixteen. He had that much compassion. So it's good to reflect on that as we practice. Without all the Buddha's efforts, those six years of austerities, and the many years of teaching difficult people, just so the drama and the vinya could be established. And here it is. It's free. So we should be overwhelmed with gratitude and practice accordingly. <laughs>